You were created to know and enjoy God. You were called to be in community so that you can become all that God desires you to be. God designed you with a purpose so you can be the difference in this world. And we exist to help you on that journey, Graceway. Welcome to Graceway Online. My name is Jennifer and I am so excited that you're here. Be sure to connect with us by dropping a comment below, by letting us know where you're from, or letting us know how we can pray with you. We have an incredible experience planned for you today. Let's join in.
fortress You go before us Nothing can stand against the power of our God You shine in the shadows You win every battle Nothing can stand against the power of our God We sing Almighty so good to see y'all. If you're new here, if you're brand new, uh, joining us in the room or for the first time online, we are so glad that you're here. Come on, church. Let's make some noise. Let's show some love to our first time guests. We're going to do something a little different. Um, normally, we do three songs at the beginning. This time, we're doing two uh, because we have a lot of stuff we want to tell you, stuff on Pastor Tim's heart that he wants to share. So I want to give us a second to just dive Right in, usually during song two, we're trying to figure out if we're still gonna worship this morning. <laughs> I wanna give you a second to do that right now. So can we lift our hands to heaven, man? We're gonna sing, believe for it, because we believe that our God still moves mountains. And so God, we love you, we thank you. We have faith, believe in God, that you're gonna do what you say that you do, because you move mountains and you still continue to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, Sonny. Yeah. 
Amen. Come on, uh, let, let me pray for you, man. Can we lift our hands to heaven? God, we thank you that you still move mountains. God, we thank you that you have the final say, no matter what the doctor says. No matter what anyone says, God, you have the final say. God, for some of us, we haven't experienced that yet. And for those people, God, I pray that you move on their behalf. God, touch my friends, God. Let them know that you're here. God, thank you for this time of worship and, uh, and always help us to be mindful to give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. It's in the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, somebody shout amen. Come on, somebody shout amen a little louder. Come on, give them praise this morning, church. Listen, why don't you fist bump somebody before you take your seat. Thanks so much. For Hey, Graceway family, I hope that you're doing well. Pastor Tim here. Wanted to hop on real quickly here today and let you know you're gonna have a little bit of a different experience on the live stream. I wanna thank you for joining us so faithfully over this global pandemic. So many of you, tens of thousands of you watching all over the country, all over the world. Just want you to know how honored I am to have you join us. Um, I am going to be talking to the church in person about some of the missions work that we are doing, especially in some of the difficult, complicated places in the world. And because I wanna uh, be conscientious about security, because I wanna be honoring, uh, we decided to shoot a quick video to let you know what's going on as we're talking a little bit more candidly in the building. But because there's so many of you who watch, so many of you who participate, so many of you who have articulated that you've been blessed by the ministry of grace, so I wanna give you an opportunity not just to watch, I wanna give you an opportunity to get involved with who Graceway is, with what Graceway is doing and some of the places that we're doing it. So I wanted to just shoot a video and let you know what those are and give you some real easy handles around it. If you've been tracking with Graceway for any length of time, you know that Graceway is just uniquely, it's exceptionally diverse. It's one of my favorite things about our church. One of my most incredible honors is just a, a kid uh, from Northeast Ohio getting to lead a church that looks like ours, uh, that, that feels like ours. Uh, you know that our church isn't only ethnically diverse, we're culturally diverse which isn't just a local representation, it's an international representation. We have over 60 languages that are spoken here and, and lots of times whenever you talk to somebody, you're gonna be talking to somebody who's coming from a different place, who has a different perspective, who has different traditions, who doesn't experience the world the way that you do. And we wanna be good stewards of that. We wanna celebrate it as God has brought it to us. And we want to acknowledge that when God brings the world to us, He's kind of reminding us that he's called us to go to the world. One of the many reasons that missions has been such an incredibly uh, core value uh, for this church is because of the makeup of this church, because we have people who have family in other parts of the world. This is a personal thing for us. When we think about the Great Commission, we don't think about theology. We don't think about concepts, we don't think about ideas, we think about practices and how do we get to the places that God is at work? How do we get to the places where people need to hear about Jesus? We believe that heaven and hell are real places and that people go there and that it is incumbent on the people of God, as privileged as us, as blessed as us, to be good stewards with everything that God has given us, to be generous with our time, with our resources, and to be a part of what God is doing in the world. And so our church is 78 years old, and really for 78 years, we've been trying to grow in this idea. Uh, I'm the fourth senior pastor, Pastor Jeff Adams, number three, lived abroad several times, pastored churches abroad several times, really brought that idea back, and when he handed me the baton of leadership here at Grace White, I understood that it wasn't just about what was happening in Kansas City, Missouri. It wasn't just about what was happening in this building, these four walls, as great as they are and as thankful as I am to have it. I understand that being the lead pastor at Graceway means that I have a heritage that I'm now responsible for. I have a stewardship of the history of this church that I'm responsible for, and I, I receive that responsibility with a, with a lot of joy 
and with a lot of sobriety. And so I want to let you know that I just got back this past Sunday from the Middle East, uh, spent about 10 days over there, have been able to do that a couple of times, and I just want to give you some good news. I want to, I want to tell you that, that God's at work in the Middle East. I, I know what you see on the news. I know there's some complicated things. I, I know that there's some scary things, but I want you to know that God is at work in an incredible way in the Middle East, and I'm excited that our church gets to be a part of it. I believe that we get to join what God is doing. It's important for us as Christians to not ask God always to join what we're doing. We do this sometimes in our prayers. We say, this is what I have going on, God. Could you help me out? Could you come to my plan and to my vision? But as a church, we wanna say, God, where are you at work? And God, what are you doing? And, and, and God, how can, how can we be bold in joining you? And I'll just tell you that when you study missions, there's really three spaces that you're looking for that God's almost always at work. God loves to be in pockets where there's a lot of different kinds of people. These places in the world where there's a lot of diversity, these places in the world where there's a lot of people groups, where there's a lot of tribes, where there's a lot of stories and traditions, uh, God typically likes to show up in that because God has a heart for the nations. You know that eventually when Jesus comes back, the Bible tells us that at the name of Jesus, every tongue, tribe, and nation will, will bow, will give Jesus the glory that he is due and the worship that he is due. And so God loves to be in parts of the world that are especially diverse and especially complicated. And he also tends to be involved when there's large moving people groups. And so we typically know these as things like refugee camps or places that are especially volatile and unstable. This is kind of the definition of the Middle East. Lots of diversity, lots of complication, lots of instability, and lots of moving people groups. And whenever there's moving people groups and there's diversity and there's instability, the, the gospel tends to, to ripen more quickly. The name of Jesus tends to be a little bit more attractive in the midst of some of these complexity and some of these tragedies, honestly, sometimes even more than it is here, where our life is pretty simple. Our life was pretty stable. Our, our life is, is pretty blessed. And so I want you to know that these are the kind of places that we're going to as a church. These are the kind of places where we're trying to join that God is at work. And I believe with all of my heart that not only does this church, but the church in the United States has a part to play. We have a part to play in the, in the global church. And, and, and I, and I want to I say to you that that the part that we have to play, I think it's changing a little bit. Um, I think that it's important for the American church to not insist on exporting American culture. That's not what God calls us to do. We're not trying to start American churches in other places. We're not trying to export the way that we do church, or the way that we view the world, or the version of the Bible that we use, or the songs that we sing. We're trying to be a part of what God is doing and have national leaders plant national churches in a contextual kind of way. If you're going to be that kind of church, you have to understand that the American church has got to get over this idea of having to control everything. We've got to get over this idea of having to take credit for everything. We get the opportunity to come alongside incredibly godly, incredibly uh, big-hearted, fascinating vision kind of leaders and simply say this, God's blessed this country economically. We have more resources than any country in the world. We just want you to know that we're with you. We want you to know that we're for you. We want you to know that we're behind you. We want you to know that we're your partners. And we want you to know that whatever you need, we're going to figure out how to provide it for you because God has entrusted us with so much, so much privilege, so much freedom, so many resources. And so we just want to help what God's doing in your part of the world. We just want to help you. And we don't, we don't want you to give us credit. We don't have to be in control. We don't want you to plant the kind of church that we want you to plant or do the kind of things that we want you to do. We want you to hear from God. And we want you to know that we believe that the church is better together. We want you to know that we believe that the American church still has a part to play. Here's the thing, you read any kind of sociology and you're going to see that, that we are post-Christian in the American church, but, but do understand that, that God's still at work in and through our country and God's still at work in the world around us. We just have to have eyes to see and ears to hear where he's at work and just not insist 
on having it our way, not insist on having control, not insist on getting the credit, but rather serving and leading and praying and knowing that God uses the weak to confound the strong and uses the foolish to confound the wise. And we gotta put ourselves in a place of a little bit more vulnerability, a little bit more service, a little bit more second chair, a little bit more we're just here to help. And we wanna come alongside some of these leaders who, I, I just have to tell you, have breathtaking courage around the kingdom of God. They have breathtaking faith around God's word and what God says is true, and they've committed themselves in ways that <sighs> convicts me. They've, they've committed themselves in ways that challenges me. They've committed themselves to the kingdom of God and the making of disciples and the planning of churches in a context that is a different world than I tend to exist in and understand. And I, I, I just want you to want you to know, man, I'm, I'm trying to learn from these leaders. I'm trying to serve these leaders. I'm trying to do everything that I can just to help these leaders. And I'm going to be taking Graceway in that direction. We want to be a church that, yes, we want to see people coming to Jesus here. We want to be making disciples here. We want to be planning churches here because we believe that whether or not our society is post-Christian, we still believe that Jesus came to seek and save those which are lost here in Kansas City. And we're excited about that. And we're going to do everything that we can short of sin to see people come to Jesus at the maximal number. We want the house of God to be full. We want the praises of God to be big. We want God to do incredible things through this church, but we also have to be a, have to be a church that has a heart for missions. It have to be a church that's generous around missions. It have to be a church that's courageous in missions. And I wanna give you a couple ways that we are going, and I wanna give you a couple ways that you can be a part. Real simple ways, things that you can do, that you can decide to do right now. I'm gonna tell you what they are. I'm gonna tell you how you can do it. And you can decide today, regardless of where you are in the world, to be a part of what God's doing through Graceway in, in the world by His grace and, and kindness to us. So the first is this, uh, man, we believe in prayer. <laughs> we believe in prayer here at Graceway. Twice a year, we pray for 21 days. In January, we we commit our year to the Lord, we, we fast and we pray, and we do that because we believe that God's worthy of our year, and because we believe that God hears us when we pray, and then we do the same in August as our kids go back to school, we, we pray and feast. We pray and fast in January, we pray and feast in August, but in both times, the beginning of the calendar year, in the beginning of the school year, it's a commitment, a recommitment to remind ourselves we serve a God who hears us when we pray. And the same is true for what God's doing in the world. I want to ask you to pray for Graceway, that we would have eyes to see, that we would have ears to hear where God is at work, that we would be courageous and know that the safest place in the world is the place that God leads us that we can be confident in God's protection and provision in our lives. And I want you to pr be praying that God would further expand our vision and further expand our heart for the nations. And then I want you to pray that God would be blessing and leading and protecting and providing for our international partners in the Middle East, in Armenia, in India, in Dubai, in Iraq, in these places that uh, God's doing incredible, incredible things that we're excited about being a part, really any country that you can think of uh, in, in the Middle East, man, we, we, we want to be a part and we want to be courageous in prayer and courageous in practice, and I want to ask you to join us in that regard. Secondly, you can give. Uh, we are in the richest church in the history of the world. We have more stuff than we know what to do with. Uh, we have so much stuff, we're arguing over the color of pews. Come on, somebody. That, that's how much stuff we have here in these United States. And so I just want to invite you very simply to begin to give to the mission here at Graceway. And here's what I mean by that. You can, you can give to Bible translations. We just finished... Uh, our fourth Bible translation here as a church. We're heading into our fifth translation. Our partner is the Seed Company. We're excited about that. I'm going to be with them later this month, but you can, you can give to Bible translations. You can give to planting churches internationally. You can give to planting churches in the Middle East, in India, in Southeast Asia, in Central Asia, in South America. You can give to planting churches here in Kansas City. We are committed 
to reproduction and multiplication in every possible way. And you can join us in that regard. And you can, you can give to the work that we're gonna be doing in refugee camps, especially in the Middle East. Uh, an incredible amount of need, an incredible amount of opportunity, not only for the gospel, but just for general kindness and service to those people groups who have been moved out of their homes, typically in really volatile environments. They need help. They need training, and I just want you to know that when you give to Graceway, you're not paying for our lights, okay? We are a generous church. Uh, the people of this church give so faithfully and so kindly. It's one of, the, one of the most humbling things to me as the lead pastor of this church, just the faithfulness of this church to give. And so I want you to know that when you give uh, two missions at Graceway, it isn't to pay for operations. We don't take a percentage of it. It all goes straight to the work that is occurring. You have my absolute word on that. And so if you wanna be a part of that, in any way you can you can give. You can see a link right there underneath me of how to do that and you can start doing that today and every dollar that you give to missions goes to missions. So number one, you can pray. Number two, you can give. And number three, you can go. You can go. You say, no, 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 I, I, I'm not a pastor. I, I don't need you to be a pastor. I've not been to seminary. I don't, I don't need you to have been to seminary. I just need you to be willing take some vacation time to go to another part of the world where I promise you God's at work and be willing to serve. Not have a lot of control, not get a lot of credit, but do humble work that God uses in incredible ways. And so let me tell you what I mean by that. We're gonna be doing all kinds of mission trips here in 2022 uh, and, and, I, and I'm needing doctors, I'm needing nurses, I'm needing daycare workers, I'm needing welders, I'm needing carpenters, I'm needing teachers, and I'm needing anyone who has skills with a sewing machine. Come on, somebody with a sewing machine, all right? I need you to understand something. We, uh, as Americans, have more skills than we think that we do, and I need you to know that this vocational skills that God has given to you, He didn't just give you so you could go make money. He gave them to you so that you could share that knowledge with people who don't have it so that they can build a sustainable life for themselves. And so for some of you, God's just gonna call you to pray, and I'm grateful. For some of you, God's just gonna call you to go into your wallet and give, and I'm grateful. And for some of you, you're gonna be taking that extra step and you're gonna be going with us. Uh, there's a link that's gonna pop up underneath me right now. If you're interested in going on some of these mission trips, if you're interested in a little bit more information of what we're doing and, and where we're doing it with a little bit more candor than I'm able to give it to you right now, email that and our global network director will be in touch with you. But we have trips going all over the world. Any skill set that you have, God can use. I'm telling you, you have everything that you need. You just have to trust that God has plans for your life. And some of you, you're going to find out that your faith is going to blossom when you get on a plane and go someplace. Some of you, you're going to find out that God's way bigger than you think. Some of you, you're going to find out that prayer actually works. Some of you, you're going to find out that you're way more blessed than you understand and that God has plans and purposes that he wants to use your life for. And some of you are going to figure out that that initial trip that you took isn't just a vacation spot, it's your future. God has some of you, he wants you to move. He wants you to move your life. He wants you to go someplace and commit yourself to the kingdom of God in a place that you don't initially know the language, the traditions, or the culture, but you fall in love with a place and you say, I wanna give my life to this place. And we wanna help you get there. And so I just wanna thank you today for considering these things. I wanna thank you today for not only watching and participating, but maybe even just taking another step to get involved here. I wanna thank you today for uh, your, your kindness and your faithfulness to our church. And I wanna encourage you and I wanna challenge you. I believe God has more for you and we wanna help you get there. I love you so much. I hope you're having a great day. I'll look forward to talking to you soon.
Are you all with me today? Okay. Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 9, the wisest man who ever lived, Solomon, asked this question. What gain has the worker from his toil? What gain has the worker from his toil? What good is working to the worker? I want you to imagine that you go home tomorrow, you go to your mailbox, you open up your mailbox, and inside you have a letter from a law office, lots of names connected to it. You open up that letter and it informs you that you have a distant uncle who has passed away and because you are his only remaining heir, he has left you a fantastic amount of money. Some of you say, I've been praying for, I prayed for this during 21 days of prayer. <laughs> I, did, I don't even need a fantastic amount, I just need a moderate amount. Here's the question. If that happened to you, would you quit your job? Would you quit your job? Now, pre-COVID, 50% of you 50% would not only quit, but the large majority of that 50% wouldn't even serve your boss two weeks' notice. You would walk in with that letter, give him two fingers, some of you one finger, and you would walk out the door and he would not get his two-week notice. And I think during COVID, that number went up. We're at an interesting space with work. I hear a lot of people reevaluating this idea of work and what it is and if it matters and if we should do it. But what has remained is this punchline of the American dream. Here's the punchline of the American dream. It is independence producing wealth. I want to be independently wealthy. We tell ourselves that if this happened to us by some sheer chance, if we happen into the right business at the right time with the right partner, that we would cash out of the system and that we would use our time for more important things. We would spend more time with our spouse. You know, the one you don't enjoy spending time with right now. We would spend more time with our kids. You know, the ones that you're angry at all the time. You would enjoy them then if you could just cash out of the system. We would take better care of ourselves. We would start exercising. Some of you have never seen the inside of a gym, but you would if you didn't have to work. You would invest in things you would enjoy. You would invest in things that are purposeful. You would become a philanthropic mogul. If only your uncle would send you a huge check. This is exactly what happened to Rogers Curvin. He found himself as an entrepreneur, having started six businesses, each of them doing well, and he was at a place in life where he could stop working. He received a cash buyout of all of his business, generation changing money. But he made a decision. He did something very wise before he considered whether or not to stop working. And he called three friends who had found themselves in the same position and taken the buyout. He called each one, and what he found was that since cashing out, two of his three friends had gotten a divorce. He found out that all of them were in what he called a soul crisis, struggling to find meaning in life, struggling to find purpose, struggling for a reason to get out of bed. He was so shaken by the conversations, he decided to take a 100% stock option to continue to work, but he decided that he was going to do a side research project, that he was going to, over the next three to five years, talk to as many individuals as he could that fit this criteria between the ages of 30 and 50, having received a cash buyout with a net worth of between five and $35 million. For the next five years, he talked to 36 individuals and what he found is that nearly all of them were struggling with depression. That 33 of the 36 had divorced since the buyout. And that the average age of the partner whom they had remarried was 23. It's not a joke because it isn't true. <laughs> it's a thing, y'all. They had all gone through several cycles of what he called purchase and despair. You know, when you buy the thing and you think, now I'm going to be had. Now I, got, now I got my boat. Now I got my motorcycle. Now I got my house. Now I got that shirt that I've been looking for. Now I have that pair of shoes. And how many of you know that it takes about the distance from the cash register to the door for it to wear off? But some of you think if I just had more money, then it would be better. But here's what I need you to understand. More money only allows you to test a broken theory. 
More money just allows you to make more dumb decisions because you have more money. Some of you have no money and you're still making dumb decisions. You ought to be thankful that you don't have more money to test the broken theory. Because if history has taught us anything, is that there's no amount of money and no amount of stuff to make you feel better about you. They had all gone through cycles of buying things, of experiences, finding it empty, struggling with depression, coming out of the depression only to start the cycle again. Twelve of the 36 individuals were Christians, but the experience was the same. In other words, being a Christian didn't change the experience. Going to church didn't change the experience. Solomon says, what does working gain the worker? Especially in this time of workplace transition due to the pandemic, does work still matter? Does it even matter? Is work, does it have a value in and to itself? Meaning, is work valuable not because of what it gives you, but just because of what it is? And here's what I know. I know that whatever your attitude about work is, you take it there every day. Whatever your attitude about work is, you, you take it wherever you go to work every day and whatever your view of work is, it tells me something about your beliefs around God and the Bible. It's that important. Most of us have three, one of three, two of three, three of three negative views of work. The first is this. We think that work is a, it's just a necessary evil. Just something I got to do, man. There's something, something that I got I I bills I got to pay, so I, so I have to work. Some of us, we even quote Bible verses out of context, of course, but we quote Bible verses to support this idea that work is just a necessary evil, that God never intended it for us, but we just have to put up with it because we're on this side of the fall, even though work existed before the fall. The second is that we think that work is meaningless. Some of us, we think it's a necessary evil. Some of us, we just think this is just... It's useless. I hear this more outside the church, but I'll tell you what I, what I hear inside the church. I hear a lot of well-meaning Christians who think and talk as though only certain work is meaningful. Christian work, spiritual work, philanthropic work, those matter to God. If you are a car salesman, God doesn't care about that. But if you teach the Bible, woo-hoo, that's really important. If you start a business, God doesn't care about your business, but if you try to be a missionary, who God cares about that. We actually, I have heard people say to people, if you really want, if you really want to experience God, you got to go work at a church. You got to leave the workplace and come work probably for somewhere around minimum wage at a church. And then we know, then we know that you're taking your faith seriously because then you're really going to do work that God actually cares about. God doesn't care about the conference table. He only cares about the communion table. Work is meaningless. Work is a necessary evil, and work is a means to an end. And for Americans, that end is dead guys on green paper. That I, I, don't, I only work so that I can get paid. The end is money because money allows me to go make memories. It's the reason that you hate Monday because it's the furthest day away from the reason that you work, which is the weekend. You wake up and you say, oh, another whole work week. That's the reason we call Wednesday hump day. I'm just trying to get over. So I get on the downward slide and then on Friday, I'll get to be who I want to be, do what I want to do because I don't have to do this dumb work thing. I want to I wanna, I wanna create memories. I want to have experiences. So I'll do this work so I have the money to do what I want to do. We think that money is for more. More what? Just more anything, right? Listen, how many TVs do you need? I mean, I mean really. And some of y'all, the TV that you got, you, gotta, you watch it like this. It's so big. <laughs> like what? what? What are we doing? What are, we, I, what are we doing? How many streaming services do you need? Well, I got Amazon Prime, I got Netflix, I got ESPN, and then Disney Plus, now Paramount's coming out with theirs, so then I can only watch these four shows. I can watch these four shows with Paramount for $14.99. I can watch Hulu, I can do this. And how, much, how many hours are you awake in a day watching a TV that you have to do panoramic view on? Why do you have six TVs in your room? You don't know, why? Because it's just more. Because I got this money 
And I just need more so that when people come over, they say, wow, this dude's got, this dude's got a lot. And so I work so that I can have more so that people can think that I have a lot because if I have a lot, then people think that I must be successful. And that's really, that's really what I'm looking for. Always think that money is for when I'm mature. Retirement in this country is the idea that I'll do what I don't want to do when I'm young so that I can do what I actually want to do when I'm old. And that always goes perfectly well, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to do the things that I want to do while I'm healthy and I'm actually able to get up out of the couch without help. I'll wait until somebody has to pull me up from the couch and then I'll have the money to do with a limp and a cough and a bad hip the things that I've always longed to do. Thank God I made it to retirement, right? Listen, the reason that our the reason that our system is broke is because our beliefs are broken. Now, if any of these make sense to you, money or work as means to an end, work as meaningless, work as a necessary evil, if any of these make sense to you, you are likely of the non-notice giving 50% when your letter, letter from your uncle arrives. Now, here's the problem. The problem is you ain't got an uncle. <laughs> And if you do, all he gives you is an awkward holiday, not a million dollars. You know what I'm saying? You don't have that, Uncle. And, and, and your beliefs mean, your beliefs about work mean that you will spend, please listen to this, 150,000 hours of your life on average. 150,000 hours, not of your waking life, of your total life. Working 40% of your life if your beliefs about work are that work is just a necessary evil It's just a means to an end. It's a miserable thing. You'll spend almost half your life Being miserable almost half your life Living beneath the potential that God says he created for half your life Because you don't understand who you are and what God says about work so the Bible, when you read it, says that the good life involves good work. You can't have a good life without good work. A lot of us think that a good life is sand between our toes, the sun over our head, and some beverage of choice in our hand. It's not the way that the Bible talks about it. The Bible connects the good life with good work. Please listen to me. Your beliefs about work... A good theology on work will help you enjoy your job. Your job and your work aren't the same thing. Your job is just the work that you do that you convince somebody to pay you for. But if you have a good understanding of what biblical work is, it'll change the way and help you enjoy your job. In the book of Genesis, we're introduced to a working God. The first introduction that we have of God is God working through his word in chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1, and then on his knees with his hands in the dirt in chapter 2 to bring about something that had not previously existed. This act in the book of Genesis uh, shapes the work week for a Christian. We work six days, and then we rest one. We work six days, and we rest one. When God creates Adam and Eve, he doesn't simply call them, their highest calling wasn't simply to forego eating certain types of fruit. Their highest calling was to continue the work that God had begun. He puts them over the garden to steward and to develop it. He gives them dominion over the garden. He hands them the keys to the work that he had begun and says, I want you to steward what I started and make it better. Work in the Bible is two parts. It's stewardship of something that exists and development once you come into it. Every single job involves the stewardship of something existing. Every job involves the stewardship of something existing. Now let me pause for a second and say something that I don't intend to be controversial. I actually don't think it's controversial outside of political realms. But I think that when you read the Bible, you will see that it is very impossible to have a biblical work ethic and not believe in creation care. It's impossible to have a 
biblical work ethic and not believe in creation care. Now, you can disagree with how we should pay for taking care of the environment. You can disagree with how politicians view green legislation. I don't have any issue with that. But I hear some Christians who say, what do I care about this? I'm not going to be here. Just let it burn. No, I care about it because God created it. Because God made me a steward over it and told me to take good care of it. And a Christian who doesn't want to take good care of what God created has problems in lots of areas of their life. I will tell you that it is almost impossible for somebody who doesn't believe that they should take good care of what God created to come into a workplace and care about what existed before them. The two are connected. I live in a world that existed before me, and I'm called to come into it and take good care of it. And in the workplace, you go into something that existed typically before you, and God says, I want you to take care of something that you didn't create. And a user in creation is often a user in the workplace. Somebody who says, I don't care about this, man. I didn't start it. It's going to exist long since I'm gone. Watch how they work. Watch how they work. I want you to think about your workplace and everything that makes it what it is. It doesn't matter where you work. I want you to think about the assets of it, the relationships in it, the time that's committed to it. A Christian is somebody who intends to steward these things well. I hear Christians talking about their workplace. My boss is so stupid. My my coworkers are so annoying. The work that we do is so lame, and they complain, and they complain, and they complain. I just want to stand there and listen to them and then say, baby, why do you think you're there? Why do you think in the sovereignty of God you got that job in that place just so you could complain like everybody else? No, you're sent there as a steward of something that existed before you. You're you're sent there to look at the relationships and the assets and the work that gets created and not to complain but to take good care of it. It is the initial commission to our first parents. Here's something that you didn't create, steward it, take good care of it, take dominion over it. It is the fundamental definition of work in the Bible. And on top of stewardship, develop it, make it better. Listen, a Christian should never go into a workplace and leave it the same or worse than they found it. Never, never. It goes against a Christian ethic of work. A Christian construction worker takes raw elements and develops them into some engineered structure. An artist takes colors or music and arranges them to speak to the soul and the heart. A barber or a beautician takes your face or your head and shapes it into something more attractive than what you walked in with. And you leave with a confidence a blessing because of the work that they did. Now, how many of you have ever gone home, looked in the mirror, and went, what is this? Well, it's what God gave you for them to work with. (laughs) But if, watch, if they ignored what was pre-existing or didn't develop it adequately, we say they did a terrible job. And you're right. They did. If if a construction worker builds a house and it falls down, we say, you did an awful job. You didn't do good work. You didn't take what existed and develop it into something better. A Christian is somebody who walks into an environment, sometimes that they didn't create, or an environment that had nothing in it, and they take all of the disparate and chaotic elements and they steward and develop it into something that is a representation of the glory of God. That's what work is in the Bible. And when we do good work, God says good work provides dignity. In Genesis 1 and verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion, authority, over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God hardwired humanity to have dominion, to create, to bring order 
and value where it wasn't before. And when we do it, it fulfills us. In Genesis 1 and verse 31, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, what did God say about the work that he had done? It's good. It's very, very good. Hard work, regardless of the specifics of your work, is good for your soul. Hard work, regardless of the specifics of your work, is good for your soul. If you want to change your self-image, if you want to change how you think about yourself, if if you want to change how you evaluate your worth, I'm going to give you some simple advice. Work harder. Work harder. The Bible talks about this repeatedly. The effect of work on a person. The effect of work on a person's perspective of themselves, on the sleep that they have, on their anticipation of the day as it's coming up. Some of us don't understand that over time an over-entertained society has no chance at being a mentally healthy society. I'm going to say that to you again. An overly entertained society is going to be an underworked society and therefore not a mentally healthy society because the two are connected. I'll I'll prove it to you. Today, go home and watch all the football games. Watch them all. Or pick 10 movies and watch them all. And right before you fall asleep at night, ask two questions. How are you gonna sleep? and how you think about your day. And have you ever done this? During COVID, you watched the entire series, 18 episodes, and you got in bed and what did you think? I'm gonna sleep great. No, why? Because you didn't work. Do you think, that was a great day, man. I feel great about that day, I'm what? No, you think, "What, what did I do? I wasted an entire day watching a show that I can't even remember the first episode. (laughs) But we recommit ourselves to seven TVs in our house, 14 streaming services of shows that will net. Some of you literally have pressure of all the shows that are on your watch list. (laughs) What is happening? Get another job. I'm, I'm, I'm being serious. You will think better of yourself the harder you work. Good work provides purpose. Genesis 2 and verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. God's work is connected to our work. Our work is caught up in what God has done and what God is doing. The Lutheran tradition refers to work as the fingers of God. When I understand what work is, I'm taking the goodness of God, the plans of God, the purposes of God, and the work that I do is, becomes the hands and feet of God. God doesn't give Adam an easy life. This is important. God doesn't, God doesn't promise Adam a good life, he, or a, an easy life. He promises him a good one. But, but watch, in America, watch what we do. We think that an easy life is a good life. We, we think my life would be great if I didn't have to work and I could just sit around. And it's not true. You can't have a good life w- without good work. And you're going to struggle to see your work as good work if you can't see what God is doing. So what is good work? What is good work? I want to answer this for you. Because I want you to understand that if you will take God at his word about work, you can enjoy any job. If you will take God at his word about work, you can enjoy any job. The Bible says that good work is three things. I'm going to give them to you quickly. Here we go. The first is this. Good work serves people. Good work serves people. God saw work flowing out of man's relationship to him into his dominion for the blessing of the community. That's what work was supposed to be. Lester DeCoster says, work is the form in which we make ourselves useful to one another. Work is the form in which we make ourselves useful to one another. Self-serving work can never be good work in the Bible. 
Well, I'm just working so I can have enough money to do what I want to do. That can't be good work. It doesn't matter what it is. I'm starting orphanages. It's still not good work if the work is for you. Listen to what the Bible says in Matthew 22. And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. I can save you reading the Old Testament. You can just skip right over Leviticus, all right? Here's what it says. Love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And loving my neighbor is more than simple kindness. Loving your neighbor isn't, hey neighbor, how's it going? Hey, I got your trash can, I put it up by your house, you're welcome. Hey, I'm a good neighbor, I'm doing what God called me to do. No, that's, being a good neighbor is evaluating my contribution to the creative order for somebody else's benefit. That my work has to be for somebody else. Listen, self-orientation always brings frustration. Are you all still with me? Self-orientation always brings frustration. I, I, listen, I can help you in your marriage, okay? Some, some of you, the reason you're frustrated is because you're self-oriented. Is because you're looking at your spouse and you're saying, I got all these expectations of what you were going to do for me and you're not doing them or you're only doing half of them or you're only doing a quarter of them. The reason you're frustrated with your spouse isn't because they're a terrible spouse. It's that you think that marriage is for you. Listen, I I'm telling you, some of you, the way that you live your life is you have all these expectations that are around the orientation of yourself. Just make a fist and just start punching yourself in the face because that's what you're doing. Just, I, I just thought you were going, I just thought that you were going to say, I don't know why you don't, why won't you ever? And they're just looking at you like, I don't know what you're talking about. But we think that everything in our life is for us, and it's the reason, baby, that you're always frustrated because you have unrealistic expectations because you impose your story onto every story. Self-orientation always brings frustration. Serving orientation always brings joy. Listen, I, just take this phrase, and in the next week, think through these two buckets, self-orientation, and serving orientation. And for the next week of your marriage, commit, no matter what happens, I am going to be low on expectations and high on service. And next Sunday when I see you, tell me how your marriage felt this week. Tell me how your workplace felt this week. Because if I'm trying to serve you, I'm not trying to get something from you. And if you happen to be nice back to me while I'm trying to serve you, well, it's gravy. But if the basis of our relationship is you have to give me something, you're always going to be frustrated. Some of us, we do it in our marriage. Some of us, we do it in the church. That was an awfully long sermon, Pastor Tim. I know. I'm trying to go quicker. I don't like the volume of that music, Pastor Brandon. I don't like the days. I don't, I don't. Well, listen, I love you. It just ain't for you. And some of it, we do it at work. My boss said... My coworker said, I don't make it. Honey, it's not for you. You're there for them. And if you would wake up tomorrow morning and you would say, I am going to work for them, it would change the way that you view work. It would change the way that you viewed your job. In other words, the most satisfied people aren't the people who don't work. They're the people whose work serves and blesses others. Now, you know this intuitively. The best doctors you've ever been to didn't point to the beamer in the parking lot. What'd they do? They sat down. They took off their stethoscope. They talked. They gave you time. They taught you. You felt like they weren't in a rush. You felt like they were enjoying doing their job for you. The best experiences you've ever had at a restaurant weren't with a waiter who was there for your tip. Sir, can I, what, what? <sighs> Have you ever had that? What? No, the best waiters and waitresses are excited that you're there. Hey, you know what you ought to get with that dish? Or for, di for dessert, listen, I, I tried the dessert, it's ridiculous. Take, take your time, they check in just the right amount. They seem to be enjoying their work and it changes your experience. Because they're there for you. 
They're not expecting you to be there for them. So connect the dots. Who benefits from your work? Who is blessed from your work? And you'll only enjoy your work when you consciously see your work as a way to love your neighbor. It's the only way. It's the only way for you to enjoy work. Number two, good work develops character. How many have kids? Come on, talk back to me. Okay. How many of you give your kids chores? <laughs> Can I tell you, uh, we give our kids chores, and uh, it would be way easier for me to just do the chores myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, I have great kids, so this is, I'm, not, I'm not dogging them, but the amount of conversation I have to have to explain the philosophic reason that I want him to take out the trash <laughs> is mind-numbing. I mean, have, you, have you, any of you at like the sixth argument, just like, forget it, I'll take out the trash. <laughs> but I'd never do that. Do you know why? Because I don't care about the chores. I care about their character. I, I don't care. You, hey, you're just wasting your time, and this is my job. This is my job to teach you about character. So by all means, waste your Xbox time arguing with me about what you're inevitably going to do. Because, baby, I'm not changing. You're getting the trash. You understand what I'm saying? There was a man who said to a farmer, you don't have to work those boys that hard to raise that corn. And the farmer looked at him with a stern face and said, I'm not raising corn. I'm raising boys. Come on, somebody. Yes. So watch. In Matthew chapter 25, it's the parable of the talents. The master gives five to one, two to one, and one to the other. The one with five and two invest and double. The one with one doesn't invest. And when the master comes back, Listen to his response. He says, Master, I knew that you were a hard man reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. And the master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. Here's what he didn't say. I really wish you had done a better job. What's he speak to? His character. He, he speaks to his character. Listen, work is one of the most necessary elements for the development of your character. Work provides disappointment. Work provides injustice. Work, work teaches you about success and ethic and integrity and sovereignty of God. This isn't God's work through you. This is God using work to work on you. And so when you think about your work, think about how can I use this job this work to be a blessing to somebody, to serve somebody else. Secondly, how is God using that work to work on you? I hate my boss. Honey, that's God trying to teach you, not your boss. I hate my job. I, hate, I don't get paid enough. Nobody cares about what I do. Okay, 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 okay. That all may be true, but what is God trying to teach you? What is God trying to develop in you? Why does God keep telling you to take out the trash? It isn't the company's trash. It's your trash. He's trying to get it out. He's trying to get it out for your blessing and for his glory. Connect the dots. How can God use your job to bless others, and how can God use your job to develop you? And then lastly, God, good work glorifies God. Good work glorifies God. Glory has to do with essence. It's the way that something ought to be. When something is as it ought to be, it brings God glory. Dorothy Sayers wrote an incredible article on work in which she rebuked the church for failing to teach people about work. She said, we failed the carpenter when we told him to be moral and to use his free time to attend church. Rather, we ought to have told the carpenter to make better tables. How do, I bring, how do I bring God glory through my work? I do the work to the very best of my ability. Listen, Christian salespeople, 
should be the best salespeople, the most integrity, the most productive, the most relationship. Christian carpenters should make the best tables. Christian welders should make the best machinery. Christian construction workers should build the best houses. Christian bosses should be the best bosses. Christian CEOs should be, the, you understand what I'm saying? Why, 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 why? Because we serve the best God. Because we serve the best God. And sometimes, because I'm trying to build a church, I ask you to do a garbage job at your work so that it can make me feel like I'm building a good church. But in doing so, I'm failing you. No, no, I want you to be the best employee because you serve the best God. And that's the way that it ought to be. The essence of what it ought to be brings glory to God. Whatever you do, do it heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive an inheritance as your reward. You are serving, you are working for the Lord Christ. What you do matters, where you work matters, but why you work matters more. Why you work matters more. Somebody was talking to three bricklayers and they said, what do you do for a living? The first bricklayer said, I lay bricks. The second bricklayer said, I build walls. The third bricklayer, a Christian, said, I build cathedrals to invite worship to my God. No, no, you just build houses. No, no, no. When I build it, it's a cathedral. No, no, when I do it, it invites worship. So here's the question, and we're done. If you could make paradise, if you could make paradise exactly as you wanted it to be, what would it be? What would it be? When God made it in the garden, he made work a central theme of it. Now, what does that mean for a Christian? What does that mean that in the garden of Eden, God put work? It means that the further you are from good work, the further you are from God's version of paradise. The further you are from good work, the further you are from God's version of paradise. Christians can quit their jobs, Christians can retire, but Christians never stop working because they know that God works in and on and through their work. You receive this today? All right. Why don't you stand up, let me pray for you. We're going to sing one song here as we close. Let me pray for you. God, we love you today. God, I know it's been a lot today. God, I thank you for the work that you're doing in the Middle East, the work that you're doing in Mexico, the work that you're doing in Armenia and Iran and, and, and India, the work that you're doing all over the place, the work that we get to be a part of here in Kansas City. Thank you for it, God. Would you give us a vision for work? Give us a vision at our jobs. Give us a vision for your glory. Give us a vision for what you say is best and right. Empower us, God, this week as we work. Empower us in our homes. Empower us to be and to do what you've called us to be and do for your glory and our joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. Can we give thanks for that message this morning? Would you join me in singing this last song? Sing with me. I'm praying, God, come and turn this thing around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. Yeah. I'm calling on that name that changes everything. Turn it around, God, turn it around, God, turn it around, cause all of my hope is in the name, the name of Jesus. Breakthrough will come, come in the name, the name of Jesus. Come on, sing it out, y'all.
something. He is up to something. God is doing something right now. He is up to something. He is up to something. God is doing something right now. He is healing someone. He is saving someone. God is doing something right now. you join us for that today if you've never been if you want to give you can do so on the way out and uh, last but not least man if you need prayer for any area of your life we have pastors who would love to pray for you so come on down and get prayer man we love you we'll see y'all next week have a great rest of the weekend y'all